here and um, thank everyone here for uh, coming to my talk. I mean, it's the, at the end of the semester, it's terrible weather, it's, uh, I, I'm very appreciative. Um, okay, my, uh, who ain't a slave? Tell me that. That's from Moby Dick. <laughs> who ain't a slave? Tell me that. The topic of Coleridge and slavery has occupied the attention of numerous critics, including William Empson, who have teased out the allegorical and subtextual references to slavery in poems like The Ancient Mariner. Another angle of interpretive analysis has yielded observations on Coleridge's evolving political views of slavery and abolition from the 1790s to the 1830s. A few critics have pointed to the connection between slavery and his addiction to opium. Uh, I assume most of you know that, that he was an opium addict from his uh, mid-twenties. A few critics have pointed, uh, uh, if, if slavery can be used as a figure for abject dependence on a drug, then one has to reflect on the implications of a figurative enslavement. The figure of slavery becomes apparent as well in his poetic writings like France and O, where the revolutionaries are depicted as slaves, and in philosophical writings where he maligned the empiricist and materialist traditions as depriving the will of autonomy. In addition to the political and legal enslavement of Africans, slavery has metaphysical and psychological meaning in Coleridge's work. Finally, I want to suggest that Coleridge's personal experience with being flogged at Christ Hospital was a point of similarity between himself and enslaved Africans, who were routinely whipped as a form of labor discipline. Using slavery as a figure for kinds of oppressive dependence, well short of racial chattel slavery, at a time when such slavery was flourishing, raises some ethical issues for us now. If one views racial slavery as the worst form of oppression at the time Coleridge was writing, does the figurative rhetoric of enslavement illegitimately capture the moral victimhood of actual slaves for those whose oppression is not comparable to that of a legally enslaved human being? However one decides that question, in Coleridge's world, the figure of slavery was used pervasively. In Vindication of the Rights of Woman, for example, Mary Wollstonecraft compares the experiences of women to that of slaves so many times that slavery is one of her favorite uh, tropes. In uh, Vindication of Rights of Woman, uh, Wollstonecraft uses women as slaves you know, uh, many dozens of times. As figurative language registers difference as well as identity and contact, one can defend the figure of slavery as a complex and ambiguous form of interactive meaning that could make empathy for actual slaves in abolitionist politics more, not less likely. I first want to look at Coleridge's writing on racial slavery in abolitionist politics. Charles de Paolo helpfully characterizes Coleridge's stance on slavery as mixed. As a Christian, he advocates emancipation on religious and ethical grounds, but as a conservative, he, he, he was a radical in the 1790s, he became more conservative as, as he got older. But as a conservative, he wants European Christian culture to replace the native African cultures. According to the Kantian ethics Coleridge has adopted, if slavery has subverted all morality, then it has deprived people of moral autonomy, which can be recovered supposedly only through a European education. De Paolo tries to characterize Coleridge's conservative perspective on slavery after his radical abolitionism of the 90s. Quote, British imperialism and Christian proselytization were interdependent. Without Christian morality as a check, imperialism would inevitably become heteronymous. But without imperialism, Christian proselytization was impossible. Although Coleridge's earlier writings on slavery are more compatible with our politics today, 
as the abolitionism and anti-imperialism are without much qualification. His more conservative views should not be construed as worse than they were. First, assuming that European Christian culture was superior to all other cultures was a commonplace view throughout the 19th century and well into the 20th. A rarely questioned assumption about Jewish emancipation, for example, in Germany, was that Jews must acquire the benefits of European non-Jewish education, Bildung, and the, use the German word, before they could become fully functioning members of German society. The idea that traditional Jewish culture was itself valuable was not seriously entertained outside of Jewish circles. And even many Jews subscribed to the social contract whereby they would give up much of their Jewishness in exchange for a German identity. Second, the idea of a liberal imperialism had far more credibility among 19th century progressives than anything close to our own assumptions about cultural diversity, multiculturalism, and cultural relativity. Marx and Engels, for example, usually reproduce uncritically the stadial view of history, which situates the Europeans as legitimate colonizers. Uh, a lot of people are surprised by that, that, that Marx is, and Engels, for the most part, uncritical about, uh, uh, about imperialism. It's not until Lenin that uh, anti-imperialism becomes uh, a central feature of Marxist thought. Third, there is little reason to suspect that Coleridge's Kantian perspective on moral autonomy is just a ruse to justify the economic exploitation of the developing world. As Carl Woodring uh, wrote, Coleridge tried always to rise above the sordidness of daily political maneuver. Peter Kitson also emphasizes the religious basis of Coleridge's politics, whether radical or conservative. Both Woodring and Kitson are describing what is distinctive about Coleridge's politics from his youthful radicalism to his later conservatism, that is, its philosophical and principled quality. The Kantian emphasis on moral autonomy and his ideas on imperialism is not persuasive, especially for us who have seen the baneful effects of self-described liberal and idealistic imperialisms, but it is not racist either, not in the sense of ascribing inexorable disabilities to one's so-called race. Barbara Paul Emile's description of Coleridge as an abolitionist reflects what seems to be the consensus view now. He went from being a strong abolitionist to a paternalist, proposing that Africans undergo a civilizing process. Moreover, he sometimes granted legitimacy to the race ideas of Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, who placed the Caucasian and European race at the top of the racial hierarchy, where Negroes and Asians were on the bottom. And in a notebook entry, he makes offensive comments on race and physical beauty. Even so, one has to remember that his public abolitionism, as well as his paternalism, was theologically and philosophically grounded. Neither position was impulsive or opportunistic. As for the race ideas, not even Blumenbach believed that race was an absolute category of physical determinism. Race at that time, as it was for you know, uh, many others like John Hunter, was a looser concept than it would become later in the century. As we turn to his earliest arguments against the slave trade, he does not make initially a human rights case against slavery on grounds of Kantian morality that people have to be treated as ends in themselves and not as means for some extraneous purpose. That would be the Kantian uh, position. Rather, he condemns slavery as a product of a society corrupted by luxury and imaginary needs. A loving, paternalistic God has given Britain everything it needs for happiness, and the sinful people have allowed themselves to become addicted to consumer goods that depend on slavery, things like sugar, rum, cotton, coffee, cocoa, ginger, and other luxuries all dependent upon slave labor and, and empire. The British are enslaved by their imaginary desires. The imagination has created slavery, which is not natural. Moreover, he reinforces the notion of a pre-industrial, economically self-sufficient society with a depiction of Africa as a utopian enclave of rural innocence and primitive communism. 
with unspecialized labor and a balanced economy permitting development of mind and body. And, uh, and in part, his utopian scheme of pantasocracy is in, definitely in line with this. Although this fantasy, which is all that it really is, although this fantasy comes from another writer, Wadstrom, the Swedenborgian abolitionist, Coleridge chooses to weave this into his overall argument. Another dimension of his earliest abolitionist discourse is his conviction that enslaving Africans and shipping them to plantations has brought upon Britain an unbearable weight of guilt, especially for having violated the Christian golden rule of doing unto others as ye would have others do unto you. In The Watchman he writes, if, if the God of justice inflict on us that mass only of anguish which we have wantonly heaped on our brethren, what must a state of retribution be? And here, he mean, us, he means British. Slavery, ha slavery has brought <coughs> upon Britain what, what he calls a horrible guilt and an un indelible stain on our national character. Coleridge's approach to the slavery issue has some other surprising lines of argument. The successful slave trade abolition movement, led by Thomas Clarkson, whom uh, Coleridge knew fairly well, provokes Coleridge to reaffirm his idea that the exceptional few, not the democratic and ignorant many, make valuable reforms in history. The abolitionists fought and conquered, according to Coleridge, the legalized banditti of men stealers, the numerous and powerful perpetrators and advocates of rapine, murder, and of blacker guilt than either slavery. In Coleridge's Edinburgh Review article on Thomas Clarkson in 1808, there's a different emphasis when he discusses slavery and commerce. No mention of the African pastoral utopia, but instead a criticism of African societies corrupted by the imaginary needs for European consumer goods. No mention of the sinful British consumerism, and instead praise of British public opinion at the expense of the French. No mention of pre-industrial utopias and instead plans for transforming African society in a Christian European direction. You can see the contradiction. He's against consumerism, but then he wants Africans to be like Europeans. So, it's... In Coleridge's 1833 marginal comments on some texts pertaining to slavery, he expresses support for gradual, but not immediate, abolition of slavery. However, he also writes that the danger of emancipation less and less imminent than that of rejection and indefinite delay. So, if he has to choose between the dangers, he'll take the dangers of immediate emancipation, but he's, he's worried about that. He expresses fear of violence against West Indian whites if military protection is withdrawn too soon. Although he also has little but scorn for the West Indian planters themselves, whom he views as unpatriotic, mercenary, and, and thieves. He would actually like to see the less morally compromised financial investors take over ownership of the plantations. In other words, to have the original owners just dispossessed. He lucidly, he lucidly criticizes the proposed apprenticeship scheme as a transition me measure to full emancipation because it would only take money from the former slave's wages and give it to his or her former owner. He displays here a realistic and humane understanding. However, he less thoughtfully rejects in another marginal note the parallel between Africans and the recently emancipated Polish indicating that the former are not as well prepared for the exercise of freedom as the latter. As we turn from actual to figurative slavery, one notes that a major part of the Biographia Literaria is a narrative of Coleridge's passage from philosophical empiricism to philosophical idealism, chapters 5 through 9. As he came to separate himself from the empiricist tradition of Hartley, he figured and maligned a philosophical tradition, materialist, materialist, necessitarian, spinozist, as enslaving the will, as advocating false beliefs with dire moral and spiritual consequences. 
The degree to which Coleridge deemed metaphysical slavery at least the equal of physical slavery is evident in his opposition to immediate abolition in the 1830s. Without the deep subjectivity that he assumed was the product of European Christian education, the enslaved African, even if technically emancipated, was still not free. What is literal? What is figurative? Or do we follow Jerome Christensen uh, in his book on, on Coleridge? Do we, or, or do we follow Jerome Christensen in seeing the operation of a chiasmus? Physical slavery is to metaphysical as metaphysical is to physical. Is the metaphysical slavery simply hyperbolic figuration? Biography Literary identifies the free will as, quote, our only absolute self, end quote. Whereas the French materialists are represented as chaining down thought with matter, which Coleridge satirically characterizes as, quote, those almighty slaves, displacing the divine creation. Although a physically enslaved individual obviously has no free will, or according to Coleridge, true humanity, there are other conditions under which one is not fully human such as, and these are his examples, working 12 hours, which makes the soul a slave, sinking the intellectual within the animal, as he writes in, uh, in his essays. Sinking the intellectual within the animal is a process somewhat similar to the way Coleridge describes his addiction to opium, which deprives him of the free will he associates with his absolute self. What he calls the poison of opium is free agency annihilating, that's his phrase. His drug addiction is a form of enslavement, as suggested by Patrick Keene. His embodied experience of being compelled to do something his will could not control makes slavery something less than wholly abstract and hypothetical. Another embodied experience permitted him to make a connection with slavery, even though the connection was ambivalent. When Coleridge was about 13, he escaped Christ's Hospital, which was the school that he was uh, a student at. He escaped Christ's Hospital and sought an apprenticeship with a shoemaker. His schoolmaster, Boyer, tracked him down and retrieved him back to school after administering to Coleridge a savage flogging, which he called fully justified. I mean, Coleridge called it fully justified, <laughs> not Boyer. Boyer assumed, assumed he thought it was justified. Because he told his teacher he left school to avoid becoming a clergyman, which he could not, as an infidel, become. Coleridge would relate this anecdote as something comic and as a tribute to his schoolmaster. But another interpretation uh, also makes sense. Coleridge fled Christ's hospital for the shoemakers not because of theological scruples, but to avoid the routine beatings that Boyer gave to Coleridge and the other boys. And Coleridge got more beatings than any other boy. Boyer was notorious for flogging the children. In his biography of Coleridge, James Gilman phrases it succinctly, Boyer was strictly a flogging master. Even the biography literary account betrays an ambivalent protest against the floggings as he calls Boyer, quote, a man whose severities, even now, not seldom furnish the dreams, by the blind fancy would fain interpret to the mind the painful sensations of distempered sleep. I mean, notice how odd that syntax is. But he, to translate, he's talking about nightmares. He has nightmares about Boyer beating him. Um, but it's, it's in this very odd uh, syntactical structure. Yet, even here, he still thanks Boyer for the education he received. The peculiar, almost ungrammatical syntax indicates a conflicted return of the repressed feeling of being abused. Moreover, Coleridge's closest friend during the mid-90s was Robert Southey, who was expelled from West Westminster School for authoring an article against school flogging in the student newspaper, and the student newspaper's name was The Flagellant, <laughs> One of Southey's best-known abolitionist poems has a sailor protagonist consumed with guilt for having flogged to death an enslaved African woman. Although Coleridge himself, at one of his Shakespeare lectures in a digression, defended the practice of flogging, 
the experience of having been flagged was a point of similarity between himself and enslaved Africans, whose flagging was viewed as an ordinary part of the slavery experience. A final instance of what I have been calling metaphysical slavery is in Coleridge's great poem, The Ancient Mariner. Not its numerous subtextual and allegorical references to actual slavery, which critics such as Empson, Evanson, Keane, Lee, and many others have uncovered. Um, I, I, I don't know if people are aware of that, but the, the poem has been read as uh, a commentary on, uh, on, on slavery in a, lot, in a lot of different ways. Um, that, that what goes on in the poem is easily uh, connected with the whole issue of slavery and the uh, fight against it, and uh, so. But, but the structural ground of the poem, which is repetition. The mariner is compelled to tell the story to a sympathetic fellow human being, his listener or reader, upon whom is imposed the same experience of compulsion that he himself survived. Like the, like the experience of addiction, the experience of repeating his tale endlessly, or at least as long as he lives, witnesses both the trauma of enslavement and the surrender of the will, which itself is enslavement. The wedding guest gets a taste of the poison of addiction and from a safe distance imagines what the trauma of enslavement would be like. The manor's fellow sailors have become the living dead are a precise image for Coleridge's nightmare of a materialistic world without spirit or of slaves without will and deep subjectivity. That is to say, the undead animated solely by powerful, inscrutable, and arbitrary power. So, uh, I don't know if you remember that part of the poem, the, 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 the sailors are killed, but then they're, they're made to be animate in order to direct the boat while the mariner is alive, but he's consumed with guilt for having been responsible for further deaths. Coleridge's own experience of helplessness in relation to his childhood abuse, his addiction, and his adult desires, which he could not reconcile with his ego ideals, allowed him to understand the anguish of enslavement. But the conflicted way in which he experienced slavery also provided the option of denial and repression. Okay. Happy to entertain uh, questions or comments. Lots of time. Lots of time. I, I didn't hear, but uh, what was was uh, Coleridge or any of his family or friends involved in? What, what, what's the history of their, their like their relationship to slavery directly? His family? Uh, nothing. I mean, no. In Britain, in uh, England itself, uh, there wasn't slavery. So slavery only existed in the uh, uh, in the empire, so in the West Indies primarily. Um, but nevertheless, England. I mean, although his family wasn't directly involved, uh, not even indirectly, but um, England got enormous wealth from from slavery. And uh, England, when Coleridge is writing, is the foremost um, uh, participant in the slave trade. So millions and millions of pounds are made from both the slave trade as well as the Sugar Islands. Um, so it's an enormous uh, financial component to the, to the overall economy. Um, so it's not at all uh, uh, a marginal thing even though within England itself, there, there isn't any slavery. Yes? Uh, you were mentioning that Coleridge was addicted to well, was opium. Now, Freud was, was, was into opium, too. And I wonder if there's something, was there something about that period, around that whole time where it... Well, it, uh, it's, for one thing, it's not illegal. Um, you could get it at the store. <laughs> just buy it. Um, and also, when, when Freud was experimenting with cocaine, it was also not illegal. Um, but Freud's experimentation is, is at the other end of the 19th century. I mean, it's, it's much, much, it's a, you know, about 100 years later. 
Um, but I mean, the, the, way, the way that opium was normally used, it was dissolved in alcohol, and it was very diluted. And so um, it was used as a kind of a strong aspirin um, and painkiller, and it was used, you know, you know, commonly. But the way that, the way that Coleridge used it, I mean, he would have enormous quantities that he would, that he would take. Um, so it, it, it was not... My question was about opium as well. Did yeah. he see his opium addiction as um, something that made him complicit in the larger project of imperialism? Oh, the, the way it does for for uh, the, the Quincy. I mean, you know, the uh, the Quincy, uh, a, a younger man than than Coleridge, but the, the two know, knew each other very well. And De Quincey has you know, confessions of an opium meter in 1820, I think. Um, and and in De Quincey's writings on his opium addiction, he definitely talks about the, the, the connection with with empire, which De Quincey supported. <laughs> De Quincey was a uh, but uh, I don't think so. But. He would have thought, and Coleridge would have known what De Quincey wrote. So, I mean, it, it was, but I don't remember any comments along those lines. But that, that, that it would make sense for him to have thought of that, but I can't think of anything where he. Especially as you said that he saw England as kind of addicted oh, guilty, to its yes. luxuries. That it, oh, absolutely. You know, sugar, oh, that part it of it for like sure. Such a striking. Oh yeah. Yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, he he had he had numerous reasons to uh, try to free himself from his addiction. Uh, yeah, add that to it. I mean, he had no problem feeling guilty. He was he was tormented by guilt. I mean, he just it just made him take more opium. Yeah. Felt so guilty. Because his, I was here. Again, this man Coleridge. He's a he's, a he's a what is he a writer? Or? He's a writer. Yeah. A writer. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's a poet. What, what year? So. Um, he's a romantic poet, and uh, he flourished in the 1790s, early 19th century. Okay. So, you know, died in 1834. Still hooked on opium. Uh, he, he was, uh, it was sort of under control, but yeah. It, he was, yeah. Mike, I'm interested yeah. in the framework for your talk, which you titled as um, Coleridge's Opium Addiction, and it's a rhetoric. Yeah. Okay. In, you know, in what way does it frame the kind of argumentation that you've been offering? Okay. So I'm, I'm seeing well, what I find interesting, among other things, is not, not simply the political issues of you know, slavery abolition, whether it should be immediate or gradual, and mm -hmm. all, all that kind of thing, but also how slavery, enslavement, um, is used uh, in, in language and in different rhetorical situations. So at this time it can be used, for example, by Mary Wollstonecraft. She, she can use it as describing the condition of women. You know, women are slaves. Or they're, you know, mar uh, being married is like being a slave. Um, also, it's used in a philosophical sense. It's used in a theological sense. So it's the same term, you know, slavery, but it's used in these different contexts. And it's uh, uh, interested in, uh, and at the core of it, I'm, I'm seeing racial slavery. I mean, because why, why are they using this? It's, it's not just because it happens to be in the dictionary. It's because at this time, uh, racial slavery was one of the most important political issues. It was fiercely debated. It was, you know, it, it was a great moral question. It was a great political question. And that's, what, and that's why Mary Wollstonecraft is using it. And that's why it has moral power. You can say, oh, you're, you know, women's condition is bad as those slaves. You know, we all know how bad that is. So it's so. Yeah. 
back uh, back then he was like a big deal. Like some people looked to him for his input, or is that what it's? Where, well, well, he became a bigger deal as uh, yeah, from the 1820s, I suppose. Oh. Yeah, it was very influential in the uh, United States for a couple of his texts. What kind of atrocity stories appeared in the popular press about the West Indies? Oh, well, uh, a lot. Uh, um, one of which, well, one of which had to do with, uh, I'll, I'll just pick one, would be um, uh, diseases. There were, um, and in fact, this gets into the, the Ancient Mariner, the fact that uh, British sailors and soldiers would die of yellow fever in you know, huge, huge numbers. And um, those from with, with African descent, they didn't die. And, and so this was interpreted as uh, a, uh, by some as divine moral judgment against, against the English. Because look, you know, the English sailors and, and soldiers are dying because of yellow fever. And the, uh, and, the, and the black slaves are not. And so this is God's judgment. So that'd be one. That, that was a very popular uh, representation. But uh, let's see, other, other kinds of things. Yeah, the, the, uh, the poem, Southey's poem, of, of, of being killed by, by being flogged, separation of families, uh, You know, trying to think of others that they're... Even Alato Equiano's book was going through multiple... Oh, yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah, because that was published in 1789, and it went through numerous editions in the 1790s. Very popular. Oh, yeah. But as... Also, things like... Um, <laughs> it was very much in the... in public opinion in terms of those who opposed it uh, promoted... Uh, Abstaining from sugar, for example, there, there was a, uh, a movement to withdraw consumer participation in uh, in slavery. So, you know, I mean, and, and sugar was the biggest product of, of the uh, plantation system in the, in the West Indies. So that was yeah, uh, that was one way. An <coughs> interesting comparison. Um, a couple decades later is um, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, which oh, yeah. uses the rhetoric of slavery throughout to right. talk about the plight of the female governess and right. seemingly ignores what's happening in the Caribbean, even though Rochester's wealth is is based on the Caribbean, right. which of course was uh, you know brilliantly pointed out later in the White Sargasso right. Sea, um, and and there's. Jane herself has the chance to um, go on the Christian imperialist yeah. mission, and although she right. decides not to, it doesn't seem necessarily that she's critiquing that. Yeah. So it except, seems very similar in that the, the yeah. use of the rhetoric. Yeah, that, that is true. Yeah, right. you're right, and, and, and it's a it's an open question of how aware Bronte is of the complicity. The slavery of the uh, West Indies and and, Ro and Rochester situation, but you're you're right. That, that does that, that's a good example. I'm wondering if anybody is critical of that the comparison of of slavery to uh, opium addiction. I mean, does it depoliticize uh, slavery? I mean, did the abolitionists object to that? Uh, I mean, what do you think? Ah. I mean, it's an interesting trope, but... Yeah, right. Well, they, th th there's... Uh, the, the abolitionists at this time like to keep things at, at, at a high moral plane, as, as they understand it. So. So they emphasize um, things like uh, uh, slavery violating Christian morality, 
um, uh, uh, Christian ethics, things like that, and uh, connecting s slavery with being addiction. No, that's not. It's definitely not something that the ab abolitionists would. Uh, they wouldn't see that. But they could say people were addicted to the money or the sugar or the. You know, yeah. Well, that's. The, Right. The power. Right. Well, well, well there is that uh, uh, critique that the Coleridge develops. That you know, the, I mean, and that's a little unusual. It, his emphasizing that slavery is a product of the imagination, of, of imaginary needs, and it's, and, and it's he's linking up. There's an 18th century, uh, you know, luxury critique um, that that he's accessing. To criticize slavery, so it's um, uh, that's rather unusual. But yeah. I, I, I must confess, my knowledge of Coleridge is very skimpy, and as uh -huh. you're saying this, I'm thinking, well, how does this fit with his overall writing? Did he write on various philosophical topics, and this was one oh, yeah. of them? Yeah, he did write on various philosophical topics, and also religious, um, and literary criticism. I mean, he was the uh, prominent uh, literary critic of the 19th century. Um, and uh, let's see what else. And, and a poet. I mean, he's, uh, he was, uh, uh, along with Wordsworth, wrote uh, lyrical ballads. So he's famous as a poet and as a, also as a political thinker. He, he very influential in terms of uh, a, a kind of paternalistic conservatism. Um, and when he was younger, he was very influential as a left-wing radical. So, but, but you said he got more conservative as he got older. Right. But, was that more yeah. conservative politically, or was it just ideologically, or his literary output was got more conservative, or all well, the above? About that, but no, it was, it was definitely more more conservative. And he was he was a uh, he was a communist. Um, he, he was a communist in uh, he was a Christian communist, but he was a communist. I mean, yeah, he, that he would use. Uh, uh, And as he got older, he became uh, uh, much more sympathetic to the ideas of Edmund Burke. And, uh, but his conservatism is very different from the laissez I mean, what we now understand as conservatism, is what laissez-faire, market, capitalism, that kind of thing. He was uh, a much more, uh, what would be the word? I don't think we have conservatives like this anymore, but I mean, paternalistic. Um, and a sense that the state had a great responsibility for its citizens. Um, that's, not, that's not the Lizzie Fair post Reagan, post Thatcher kind of conservatism at all. I don't think it exists anymore. Yes? The whole discussion about rhetoric of slavery and its connection to real slavery, uh, it reminds me of. Uh, this famous article in a book by Susan Buck Morris, which he claims oh, yeah. that uh, oh, Hegel's oh, oh, on the, on the dialectic Haitian of the slave and yeah. the master uh, right. uh, was inspired by his knowledge of the events yeah. happening in Haiti during the right. Haitian Revolution and all that. And <coughs> I'm curious about whether the Haitian Revolution itself, which was the, the, the big news in the oh, early was here. century, yeah. or just the Slave revolts, in general, play any role in, in Coleridge's formulation of slavery, whether, whether oh, rhetorical absolutely. or whether, uh, but particularly, does he consider, I mean, other the, than abolition, meaning Europeans yeah. releasing Africans from slavery, whether he contemplates the possibility or the rightfulness of slaves working for their own liberation uh, as something desirable or something that he fears or, or in any way at all? 
Well, his his views change. I mean, you know that, that he's that he's um, more more sympathetic to um, sl slave revolts, you know, earlier on um, than he's later. And later, he's more worried about oh, what's going to happen to the white owners when the uh, uh, when, when, the, when there's a slave rebellion. But he's he's very thoughtful about it, and and he and He's, it, uh, he's more impatient with th those who are opposing abolition altogether. So he says, well, if, you know, if, if abolition keeps being delayed, there'll be a violent outbreak. And then he's saying, well, OK, you have to go. You have to support the violent outbreak because you know, it's, it's, it, it's insupportable. Um, but yeah. Uh, he was very much uh, aware of, uh, of, of slave rebellion. Um, and in fact, it, it, one, one reading, which uh, I think is pretty persuasive, of, of the ancient mariner is the degree to which the ancient mariner, although you know, tormented by, by guilt, is nevertheless identified with slaves, um, particularly the, the, um, in the poem, there's much emphasis, well, much, there's repeated emphasis on his dark skin. The, the ancient mariner has you know, his brown hands, he's, you know, he's dark, dark skin. And that's you know, one sort of uh, you know, metonymic connection between the, the mariner himself and, um, uh, and, and slaves. And, and that poem itself, that's his most famous poem. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's a poem about slavery uh, uh, in numerous ways. I mean, figurative, literal, um, that the ship on which the mariner is sailing is said to be its like a, you know, a slave ship. Um, and the, the experience of the soldier, of the sailors dying so suddenly. <coughs> Is like the experience of the yellow fever, which uh, decimated uh, British uh, sailors. It, when, when Coleridge is writing The Ancient Mariner, there had been something like uh, I mean, a huge number, I mean, many, many thousands of British sailors and soldiers had died in the West Indies. I mean, it was you know, close to 100,000. Enormous number of casualties. I'll have to, I'll have to reread that poem again before long. Yeah. Though so recently I heard a uh, statistic about the slave trade and how many, um, you know, Africans in transit across the ocean died. Oh yeah. You know, so many of them, you know, never even made it. And you know they're just like chucked overboard, and, I, and I'm sure Gil Coleridge got accounts of this kind oh, of stuff. Oh, too. absolutely, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the horrors of the Middle Passage were were very well, uh, very well known in public opinion, particularly in the 1790s. Absolutely. When did Britain of uh, uh, Itself make slavery illegal because I know what the United States did it later, but obviously. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, slavery in the empire was abolished in the 1830s, and it was it was in steps, but it started in the early 1830s, and then by I forget the date, but 36 or something like that, it was uh, completely abolished. Slave trade was abolished in 1807 or eight. I forget which. And then slavery within England was abolished by a court decision. The Somerset, uh, uh, and the decision in that was uh, I forget the date, but the the seventies, seventeen seventy. Um, so, but you're right, it's a lot sooner than a lot sooner than the U.S. <laughs> 